Today, we're plunging into the alluring world of finance, specifically those groundbreaking claims that promise to predict stock market movements with almost uncanny accuracy. Imagine a cutting-edge machine learning strategy that claims it can do just that, even with very, very little data. Sounds almost like a financial magic trick, doesn't it? It absolutely does. And that's precisely what caught the eye of many in the finance world and actually what led you, our listener, to share these intriguing sources with us. This deep dive focuses on a recently popular approach using something called random Fourier features, or RFF, for stock market index timing. Right, RFF. Mm -hmm. And the initial claim from a pioneering paper by Kelly, Malamud, and Zhu, we'll call them KMZ, was truly, well, stunning. It really challenged deeply held conventional wisdom. They presented a strategy that reportedly used a massive 12,000 RFFs derived from just 15 original variables, trained on only 12 months of data, and still achieved strong out-of-sample performance. Which just flew in the face of what everyone thought. You know, the idea that you need decades of data to find any real stable predictive signals in the notoriously noisy stock market returns. Exactly. It raised some pretty fundamental questions about what's truly possible in financial forecasting. Hmm. So our mission today is to pull back the curtain on this seemingly virtuous complexity. We'll explore the intricate details of this strategy, the surprising theory behind its reported success, and crucially, its potential downsides. We want you to really understand what's going on behind the numbers. Yeah, so in a world just flooded with information and new breakthroughs every day, what does this deep dive mean for you, the learner, who wants to cut through the hype and get to the core of what's real? Let's unpack this. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more Quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Okay, let's start by looking closely at this virtuous complexity strategy as presented by KMZ. How did they actually build this model? Okay, so at its core, it leverages random Fourier features, RFFs. Think of RFFs as a sophisticated way to take a small number of original identifiable variables, let's call that K, and mathematically transform them into a very large number of new nonlinear features, P. K into P. Right. In the KMZ paper, they took just K equals 15 underlying predictors, things like those from the widely used Goyle Welch data set, that's a standard collection of macroeconomic and financial data people use, plus some lagged index returns, standard stuff, really. Okay, 15 variables. But from those 15, they generated a staggering P equals 12,000 RFFs. Wow. So you take this small handful of original predictors, blast them out into 12,000 new complex features. That sounds like a lot of variables for well, potentially not many data points. What do you do with them then? Then this incredibly complex set of RFFs is used in what's called a ridgeless regression to predict excess returns on the stock market. Now, this is crucial. Ridgeless here means there's no explicit shrinkage or regularization applied. No regularization. With 12,000 predictors, that sounds risky. It might sound counterintuitive, even risky, exactly, especially when you have far more predictors, P12,000, than observations in your training data, which could be as low as T12 months. Normally in machine learning, if P vastly exceeds T, you'd expect massive overfitting, right? Right. The model just memorizes the training noise and performs terribly out of sample. But here's where it really gets surprising. They used rolling training windows as small as T equals 12 months. Just one single year of data. This deeply contradicts conventional wisdom, which, as we said, holds that to extract any useful, persistent, predictive signals from financial variables, you need sample sizes spanning decades, not just a single year. It's like trying to predict a marathon winner based on how they ran in the first, I don't know, 100 meters. Seems impossible. Precisely. So the reported stunning result by KMZ was this strong out-of-sample performance for their market timing strategy. On its face, it suggested that heavily over-parameterizing models, where P vastly exceeds T, could somehow lead to excellent out-of-sample predictions. It seemed to radically overturn established thinking in financial modeling. Okay, so a complex model, minimal data, stunning results, mm -hmm. almost feels too perfect. But as often happens with these groundbreaking claims, someone else comes along to scrutinize the mechanics. 
What did Stefan Nagel's research uncover about this stunning performance? Yeah, this is where it gets really, really interesting. Stefan Nagel's research steps in to challenge the whole idea that the RFF-based strategy learns genuine predictive signals. He argues its success is, in fact, more like a coincidence. A coincidence? How so? That seems like a strong counterclaim for something that looks so powerful. Can you explain the mechanism behind that? Absolutely. The core argument rests on what happens mechanically when the number of predictors P, vastly exceeds the training window observations, T. In that specific setup, the RFF-based forecast, because of how this ridgeless regression works, essentially just, well, it reduces to a simple weighted average of the T training sample returns. A weighted average of past returns. Yes. And the crucial part here is that the weights aren't learned from some deep market insight. They fundamentally depend on the similarity between the predictor vectors in the training data and the current predictor vector you're using to make the forecast. So it's not truly learning a complex new relationship between, say, inflation and future stock returns from scratch. It's more like if the economic conditions today look very similar to last month's conditions then it mechanically assumes the market will behave similarly to how it did last month. And if we connect this to the bigger picture, especially with these very short training windows like T equal 12 months, and given that the underlying predictors, like those Goyle-Welch variables, are quite persistent, they don't jump around wildly month to month, then similarity primarily reflects temporal proximity, meaning recent predictor observations, say from the previous month, are just naturally the most similar to the current month's observation vector. Which means the forecast effectively becomes a recency-weighted average of the T-return observations in the training data. So for you, the listener, this translates into something you might recognize. It's essentially a momentum strategy. Pretty much. It's putting higher weights on the most recent past returns, implicitly betting that what happened recently will continue. Okay, so it's sort of stumbling into momentum. Is that the whole story? Well, there's another layer. The strategy also subtly embeds a form of volatility timing. What's fascinating here is that the math works out such that similarity declines with predictor volatility. Hmm. How does that work? When the predictor variables are less volatile, their distances from one another in this high dimensional space are smaller. That leads to higher weights being placed on past returns when making the forecast. So the strategy inherently becomes less aggressive when volatility is high. Ah, so it naturally dials back the risk when things get choppy. Exactly. It's a built-in de-risking mechanism that emerges purely from the math, not from learning that de-risking is good. So the aha moment then is that this super complex 12,000 feature strategy doesn't learn that momentum is profitable or yeah. that de-risking during high volatility is smart. Instead, it just mechanically constructs a volatility timed momentum strategy purely because of how ridgeless regression behaves with lots of persistent predictors and not much data. That's the core insight. It's not some super intelligent AI figuring out market secrets. It's basically a non-parametric kernel smoothing approach. And with such a short window, it can only effectively average the most recent returns because those are the most similar. And then it automatically adjusts for volatility. The strategy doesn't learn momentum, it constructs it. So the virtuous complexity isn't actually adding much virtue if a much simpler strategy can mimic it or even explain it away. How did Nagel empirically demonstrate this? What did the actual numbers reveal? Right, this is key. Nagel empirically proved this by showing that a much simpler volatility-timed momentum strategy, one that just assigns linearly declining weights to the past 12 months of returns, scaled by the inverse of predictor volatility, generates market timing positions that closely resemble those of the RFF-based strategy. It closely resemble. Very closely. And, crucially, it achieves comparable out-of-sample performance. That's quite a statement. So the complex, highly touted RFS strategy performs basically no better than a straightforward, easily understandable momentum strategy. Mm -hmm. Let's talk specifics. What did the quantitative proof say from Nigel's table I actually show? Okay, let's look at the numbers. The high complexity RFF strategy initially showed an annualized alpha of 0 0.034 with a T statistic of 2.417 and an information ratio or IR of 0.255. Those numbers, you know, they sound decent in isolation. Okay, alpha of 3.4%, IR of 0.25. Not bad. But then Nagel looked at a kernel-based strategy, which is a more transparent math representation of what the RFF is effectively doing. And that actually gave a higher alpha of 0 0.040 with a t-statistic of 2.90 and an IR of 0 0.306. Already better. Huh. And what about the really simple one, the explicit volatility-timed momentum? 
That simple strategy yielded an even larger t-statistic of 3.684 and an IR of 0.388 for the same alpha of 0.034. So the simplest approach delivers comparable, if not statistically better, risk-adjusted returns without any of the black box complexity. Wow. So similar results, maybe even better stats with way less complexity. But the real test is whether the simple strategy explains the complex one, right? The spanning test. Exactly. And this is where the definitive proof lies. When the returns of the simpler kernel-based strategy are added as a factor to explain the RFF strategy's returns, the RFF strategy's alpha drops to almost exactly zero. Specifically, alpha minus 0 0.001, t-stat now 0.122. So the simple strategy completely explains away the RFS strategy's performance. Pretty much. It indicates that the complex strategy's returns are largely, if not entirely, driven by this simpler, mechanically generated volatility-timed momentum factor. This raises an important question, then. What about recession timing? The original KMZ paper suggested their complex strategy learns to divest leading up to recessions. Does Nagel's work debunk that, too? Yeah, Nagel shows this is also likely more mechanical than learned foresight. The strategy naturally de-risks when predictor volatility increases, and predictor volatility often does increase before recessions. So it's not the RFS strategy seeing a recession coming based on subtle economic signals. No, it's just reacting systematically to increased volatility, which just happens to be correlated with pre-recession periods. It reacts to a signal of volatility, but it doesn't understand the underlying cause, the recession itself. That makes sense. And it also seems like this whole phenomenon isn't maybe a widely known anomaly for the aggregate market. Perhaps because, as Nagel notes, most of the gains for these strategies accrued until the 1970s. Right. That historical context really matters. It suggests these aren't necessarily persistent, reliable signals going forward, or at least haven't been for decades. Okay, this all leads to the most crucial question. Does the RFF strategy really learn? Nagel conducted some fascinating simulations designed to definitively prove whether it learns or simply applies a fixed mechanical structure. How did he put it to the test? Indeed. These simulations are very telling. In the first one, Nagel generated artificial market returns that exhibited clear reversals, meaning strong negative autocorrelation instead of momentum. The logic was simple. If the strategy truly learned from the data, it should adapt to this new dynamic and identify the reversal pattern, maybe even profit from it. Right. It should flip its bets if the market flips its behavior. Yeah. And what was the outcome? Did the RFF model figure out the reversal? Shockingly, no. The RFF-based ridgeless regression continues to produce forecasts that assign the same positive inverse volatility weighted weights to recent returns. It kept betting on momentum, even when the data screened reversal. Exactly. For you, this means it still acts like a momentum strategy, blindly betting on continuation even when the artificial market is clearly reversing. And the stunning part. This resulted in significantly negative out-of-sample abnormal returns on this artificial data. The alpha was negative 0.143 with a t-statistic of negative 1.835. Wow. That's, that's pretty damning evidence. It means the RFF model does not learn from the data whether momentum or reversal dynamics are present. It just mechanically produces momentum-like forecasts regardless of the underlying return process. Precisely. If it were truly learning, it would have adapted. To claim it learns, you'd have to somehow explain why it mislearns so badly here, actively timing the market in the wrong direction. It's like asking a calculator to subtract and it just keeps adding because that's all it knows how to do. Okay, that's simulation one. What about the second one? The second simulation involved creating artificial wild bootstrap predictors. What Nagel did here was create new predictor variables that deliberately removed most predictive content, but crucially preserved their persistence and the time series structure of their innovation volatilities. So fake predictors that look statistically similar to the real ones, persistent similar volatility patterns, but don't actually predict returns. Exactly. The test was straightforward. If the RFF strategy learned genuine predictive signals from the content of the original predictors, its performance should plummet when you feed it these essentially useless signal-free predictors. Makes sense. And the outcome? Did performance collapse? Quite the opposite. Get this. The RFF-based approach continues to deliver nearly the same out-of-sample abnormal returns as it did with the original supposedly informative data. You're kidding. Same performance with fake data. Almost the same. The information ratio was 0.228 for the artificial data compared to 0.255 for the original data. It barely dropped. 
This strongly supports the interpretation that the RFF-based regression imposes a mechanical volatility-timed momentum structure and is inconsistent with the idea that it extracts genuine predictive signals from the data. It reinforces that the structure comes from the method, not the data's message. So it's not learning anything. It's just consistently applying its pre-programmed mechanical trick, regardless of whether the data actually contains useful information or not. This really highlights a fundamental limit, doesn't it? A limit that even fancy machine learning can't just magically overcome. It absolutely does. The core problem this entire analysis points to is a broader limitation in, well, any kind of financial modeling, especially with machine learning. When the true expected return function is high dimensional, like P in the thousands, but your sample sizes are small, like T12 months, little can truly be learned from the training data. There's just not enough information. So even if the underlying market relationships were perfectly clear and there was absolutely zero noise in the data, a fantasy scenario, it would still be almost impossible to learn anything meaningful with such limited observations. That's the theoretical kicker. Nagel points out that even in a perfectly specified model with zero noise, the achievable Sharpe ratio for T12 months and P12,000 is extremely small, around 0 0.0005, which annualizes to about 0 0.017. 0 0.017, that's tiny. It's more than an order of magnitude lower than the empirically reported results by KMZ, who found an information ratio around 0 0.30. This massive gap really underscores just how little can genuinely be learned from such short samples, even under ideal conditions. Why is it so small, theoretically? Why can't the model learn more, even in that perfect noise-free world? Because mathematically, the estimator can only recover a weighted average of the true underlying coefficients. Much of the information remains unidentifiable from the limited sample. The training data, those 12 months, only allow the model to learn about predictability in the small t-dimensional subspace it actually observes. It just can't see the full p-dimensional picture. It's like trying to understand a whole complex landscape by just looking at 12 individual square feet. You miss the mountains, the rivers. Great analogy. And this limitation isn't just about market timing, right? It has broader implications. Yes. Nagel suggests this fundamental limit extends to other areas, like cross-sectional asset pricing, predicting differences between stocks, not just the overall market. For example, in other work involving some of the same authors, like Dideheim, K, Kelly, Malamud, or DKKM. Though interestingly, they note that longer training windows, maybe T360 months, 30 years, might mitigate this to some extent, as DKKM did report higher sharp ratios with longer samples, so time helps. But crucially, just sampling more frequently within that short window, say using daily data instead of monthly over the same 12 months, doesn't really solve the core problem if the predictors themselves are persistent. Right. It's the total length or span of the training sample that truly matters for learning about persistent relationships, not just how many times you measure things within that short span. Okay. So let's try and wrap this up. What does this all mean for you, the listener? The initial stunning empirical success of complex machine learning models like random Fourier features for stock market timing, especially with these incredibly short training windows, well, it doesn't necessarily come from the virtue of complexity or any genuine learning. Instead, as we've seen through Nadal's analysis, it often boils down to a fortunate coincidence. The RFF approach, when applied to small training samples with persistent predictors, just mechanically reduces to a volatility-timed momentum strategy. And that simple strategy just happened to perform well historically, particularly before the 1970s. This deep dive is really a powerful testament to critical thinking, isn't it? The ability to distinguish between a model that truly learns in a DEX versus one that merely mechanically constructs something that looks like a profitable strategy due to its inherent structure. Absolutely. This reminds us of a fundamental maybe often overlooked challenge in financial machine learning. While complexity can be virtuous in certain contexts, you know, when you have tons of data and the problem demands it, it simply cannot overcome the inherent limitations of small sample sizes and noisy data, especially in finance. So when you encounter groundbreaking claims in any field, particularly those involving vast complexity built on very little data, it's worth pausing and considering that critical ratio the ratio of sample size, T, to model complexity, P, it might just reveal whether true learning is likely at play, or if you're looking at a fascinating yet ultimately mechanical outcome. So maybe the final thought for you is, what stands out to you about how much we can truly expect to learn versus how much might just be constructed when we have such limited data trying to explain such complex systems? 